The Economics of Climate Change, A Case for Compromise. Climate change is the hottest topic, so to speak, in today's political conversation, the two sides of the argument defending the extremes. Pennsylvania Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman said it best, claiming the R's need to get real on addressing climate change while the D's need to get real on our need for energy. This short video presents the case for a middle ground, somewhere between doing nothing and a complete ban on the production of carbon energy, or metaphorically, between letting our nose continue to bleed versus cutting our nose off to spite our face. In 2018, William Nordhaus won the Nobel Prize for modeling the economics of climate change. He put a future cost on humanity dealing with the various intensities of catastrophe that climate models forecast. He then put a cost on humanity today making the sacrifices necessary to meet specific emission targets. He presents three cases in this plot of future CO2 emissions versus time. First, a do-nothing or base scenario where emissions continue to increase at current rates. Second, a do-everything or stern scenario where emissions are taken to zero as quickly as possible. And third, an optimum scenario where the cost we pay today is commensurate with catastrophe costs we avoid in the future. I am sure that one could pick apart the assumptions that went into either his temperature forecasts or his economic models. So let's forget the specific numbers and make some high-level observations. First, even the do-everything scenario acknowledges the fact that emissions can't go to zero immediately, but will take some time, and as an aside, will require battery technologies and electrical infrastructure that don't currently exist. Even if the technologies were available now, we would still need and use carbon energy during the transition. Second, the do-everything scenario still doesn't meet the 2 degree increase in temperature target set by the Paris Climate Accord. No matter what we do, man is not going to stop climate change in its tracks, whether man-made or natural. It appears the Earth is going to continue to get warmer, so we should put resources toward preparing for that inevitability. And third, the optimum scenario is a balance between do-everything and do-nothing. Future poor people living in low-lying areas are at risk from rising sea levels. However, current poor people need energy now and are even more at risk if the current cost of energy increases substantially. The roughest living conditions on the planet are where they have little access to energy, and those living there are more worried about what is for breakfast than they are about climate change. To reiterate that point, in 2017, almost 1.6 million people died worldwide from diarrheal diseases, mostly in poor countries because of lack of sanitation, which again takes energy. Same year, less than 10,000 people died in natural disasters. If we are worried about the poor of the world, we should be at least as concerned about trying to provide them energy now as we are about whether their descendants will survive natural disasters in the future. The bottom line is that with carbon energy currently providing for 80% of our energy needs, confronting climate change without devastating the poor and destroying our economy will take a balanced approach. In response to the coronavirus, even climate activist Alex Trembath recognizes that our economy runs on carbon energy. And if there's one thing the virus shutdown has clearly illustrated, it's that the economy is not just about money, it's about people. In a prior article, Trembath compared climate change to diabetes, implying that it can't be addressed in a knee-jerk emergency resolution. Climate action, he says, is more likely to be a long, sustained process, not a satisfying, revolutionary one. To that end, we absolutely need to proactively develop more lower carbon energy sources. Wind and solar will continue to grow, as they should, but even after massive investments these last few years, they still provide less than 4% of our energy use. Because of their significant limitations, they are not the ultimate and only answer. As Bill Gates is promoting, society needs to get over its fear of nuclear energy, and environmentalists need to get over their opposition to new hydroelectric dams as these are both excellent baseload sources of carbon-free energy. And we need to continue our research in other technologies, such as fuel cells and fusion. In all probability, the final solution will be a combination of many technologies, including the use of clean-burning natural gas. But all of this will take time, and until those technologies mature and the infrastructure is built, carbon energy will continue to be the much maligned workhorse that keeps our homes warm lights on, our cars running, and the economy humming. In closing, the path forward should certainly not be the status quo of relying so heavily on that workhorse. But on the other hand, shooting the horse while we still need it would be economic suicide.
Nordhaus presents a case for compromise. Let's hope we can meet in the middle. The end of this video anyway, if not the debate. Thank you for watching this video and for taking the time to learn more about energy. Please go to YouTube to find other educational videos I've published on energy. It is certainly a topic worth your time and effort to understand.